Well, you might think like where the presentation, like I'm doing this here, but no, it like the the non nutritive sweeteners, the low calorie sweeteners outperformed water drinkers and weight loss. And so then you have to think to yourself, like, why would that happen? What would what would be taking place to, to, to make that play uh, for, for that to happen? Also, the, the, the low calorie sweetener group regained significantly less weight on follow ups. And again, I told you that's an issue with all adult weight management is we see this slow creep back up in the weight. And so they regained less as well. So, so really for me, like, why does that, like, where's the theory in which this starts to make sense for us? Um, so I, there, there, there's a couple of birch and rolls there. I, I love the research that they do. And they do research in terms of weight loss and like what, what promotes weight loss? What are some of the behavioral mechanisms of weight loss? And they've studied the issue of restriction very closely. And um, what they'll tell you is that it is an incredible mistake to restrict. When you feel like you are, you are restricting yourself, you will eventually take in way more of that substance than what you wanted to do. We see it over and over again. Um, if you are a parent and you tell your child no more of this food, your child will eat more of that food, right? Um, they did a really simple study, um, clever. Kids are brats, and this really shows it really well. Um, they had mothers tell their child in a room that had a lot of sweets but a lot of healthy choices. They had the mother say one of two things. Um, the mom either said, hey, you can have whatever you want in here, or the mom said, make a healthy choice, don't eat that junk food. And then the mom steps out of the room. And you know what the kids did that were told not to eat the junk food? Yeah, you got an idea, right? Like they immediately went and they ate the junk food because it's this issue of restriction. When we're told not to do something that we want to do, we will engage in more of the behavior. And so for me, this makes all sorts of sense in, in terms of restriction. How many of you, when you go on a diet, you feel like you're being restricted? You feel like, now, like when, when, when I'm forced to go on a diet, and usually I'm forced to, right? Because I don't want to. And then I walk around angry most of the time, right? Because I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm not being satisfied with the things that I want. And when I feel that way, I eventually reach a point where I say, I don't care anymore, right? Or I eat a little bit, or I just think, oh, I'm just going to have a little bit of that, and a little bit of that becomes a whole bunch. And that's what happens with restriction. And so it's really possible what happens with folks that are dieting is this, is, is this issue of restriction. And I would say a low-calorie sweetener can definitely help with an issue of restriction. Like, you don't have to take all of the sweet taste away. You get to maintain some of that sweet taste, and again, it's helping you to reduce calories. So with all of that, like, so, so I just showed you the, the really like a lot of studies that have taken place that are randomized controlled trials that show it again and again, like low calorie sweeteners can help with modest weight losses. The question is like, do we just stop studying the issue then? Why, why is it that this issue keeps coming up over and over and over? Why do we see somebody tell us we should research this hypothesis when really there's a ton of evidence for it? I don't... I don't have the answer for that. Like, I really don't know what makes it such a low-hanging fruit where people say, I want to go after it again and again. I, I kind of gave the answer um, that, that I think may be the truth. Is I think there's something in us to say it, it, this might be too good to be true. Like, there's got to be something that's wrong with this because like, there's got to be an issue with it. And, and I tell you right now, like, I just don't believe that we see any issues with this. In fact, it may help us with modest weight losses. But it's not, um, like, if you think it's just weight losses, I, I tell you that there's, there's other benefits it looks like with low-calorie sweetener use. Um, low-calorie sweetener use is associated with better diet quality and lower sugar intake. They don't appear to increase appetite, and they don't have any discernible um, effect on satiety. It doesn't mean that you're uh, less satiated. People who switch from sugar-sweetened beverages to diet beverages can consume fewer desserts than those who switch to water. Again, it may be that issue of restriction of sweetness that they're looking at there. Um, it tends to reduce the intake of sugar-containing foods and to facilitate weight loss. And diet beverage consumers report feeling less hungry. 
Okay, so, so, so a lot of this is self-report and a lot of this is, but like we have an idea of why this might be working, of the issues that we're seeing and what's going on with it. And so um, I definitely tell you the preponderance of evidence say these help with modest weight losses. And, and again, I just want to remind you, like, they're, they're safe for consumption. It comes in many forms. It's not, most of the studies that take place, and, and I kind of hate that this is true, most of the studies that take place, this takes place within beverages, but low-calorie sweeteners are used in all sorts of parts of the food supply. Um, and I think it would be great to have more studies that look at low-calorie sweeteners in other food groups as well. Um, it's a sweet taste with few calories, and, and, and as I hope that you've seen, it can play a significant role in lifestyle management. Um, we did this study of like, like maybe it's hard for people to make changes because most of these studies take place with adults. And, and there's this idea that the younger that you make these changes, the easier it will be. And so maybe like we could get people to like water more if we started them at a young age. And so what we did is, um, I know this is going to sound crazy, but we did this study with babies. And we had babies talk to dietitians, and dietitians gave them nutrition counseling. And I know you're thinking that's a ridiculous study to do, but I think these results will make sense to you, right? Um, like they're all angry at us, right? Like even this 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 guy right here on on the right, like I have nightmares thinking about what he. We actually didn't do the study on babies, but you get the idea. Like like any kind of dietary change that we're asking people to engage in, is hard. It's incredibly difficult, and I don't care what age you are, like it brings about feelings of anxiety. It brings about truly, like I don't want to do this forever. And so how do we find some things to say this can support me doing this in the very, very long term? Especially when we have an environment out there that is full of delicious foods that are readily available at cheap prices. What do we do to combat that? Part of it has to be the, the ways that we make food has to shift as well. We have to change the food environment. Part of changing the food environment is reducing the calories in the foods that we're eating. And I think that this has to be part of the role that low calorie sweeteners are going to play. But, not, but I want to make sure that it's, it's, it's not overstated as well, right? It's not an appetite suppressant. It's, it, it's not like I would go and say somebody that's trying to lose weight, like this is the, this is the secret to it. No, it's really not. Um, this is just one of the small changes approach that someone ought to do. It's one of the largest obstacles that we have in lifestyle management is adherence. And I would tell you that I think a sweet taste is going to help with adherence to the suggestions that we make behaviorally. Now, the long-term practical application, like it, always, and I, I've discussed that, is really hard to get people to make changes for a very long period of time. How do we simplify that? How do we encourage that? What are the small shifts that you can make? We, we do this with physical activity as well. Like, instead of parking close to where you're going, park far away and actually walk in. Right? When you can, if you don't have to drive to the store, like walk to those. We try to make these small changes. Use the stairs and not the elevator escalator. Small changes are an answer here. Something that we can do on a regular basis that we don't say, now I'm just going to quit doing that in a couple of weeks. It's something that I can maintain. And I do think that low calorie sweeteners are one of the things that we can maintain with what we do. Because ultimately, like this obesity epidemic, like it's a true epidemic. Um, and, and what I tell you is it, we know it is because it impacts our pets as well. Maybe not here in Brazil, but in the United States, our pets even have a problem with obesity, right? Like if you have an overweight dog, you can put it on a diet or a cat. There's actually medication, right? Like pharmacological intervention that you can give to your dog, it's called Slentrol. And, and I love the warning on Slentrol, right? It's, it's for a dog, and it says not for use in humans. And I think we all know why it says not for use in humans, because we're thinking it worked for my dog, and maybe it just might work for me, right? Um, 
Because there's so many things that get in the way of us being able to lose weight and us being able to maintain weight loss. And you ask me why? The Houston Rodeo is just getting over. I would have invited you all to come up and I would take you to the Houston Rodeo um, and I'd get you some deep fried Twinkies. Uh, you guys have deep fried stuff here, right? No? Yeah? No? You should. It's delicious. Like, it's, it's, it's unbelievable, right? But what we do is we take these calorically dense foods and we make them calorically denser, right? We, like, we add it and then it's like this attractive thing. Like, people go, I need to try that. Uh, one of the more recent craves is chocolate-covered bacon, like a bacon dessert, right? And, and like maybe that's just crazy Americans. I'm not sure what's going on with that. There's a bacon milkshake that you can buy at some of the fast food restaurants, like where we have this idea of like the more that I can put in. And, and not only that, but we know in studies for men, this isn't so true for women, if we put up the number of calories in a meal and we put the cost the same, men choose the meal with more calories because they want more calories for their money, right? Like we have this attitude of, in a Western world, of wanting to get more and more and more. And like somehow we have to start to shift that attitude. And somehow we have to shift that idea that you can still receive the things that you want and you can still receive the taste and the satisfaction from the things that you get, but, but with fewer calories. Um, but I still, for me, I just, just like in summing up, even from my last talk, I, why do we continue to see studies asking the questions? And, and especially why do we see it in rodent and epidemiology? Why do we continue to see these studies coming up and asking these questions? And I'm not afraid of conversations. I think science, really should be viewed as a conversation, right? Instead of pitting one side against the other, which is what I think happens a lot around these topics, like we should be able to sit down and have a conversation about it. Hey, oh, so this is what you see, well this is what, like, and this come together and come up with some sort of consensus. But I think what we find is people trying to say I'm on this side or I'm on this side of it. And instead of sitting down to look at all of the science, we say, well, I like this study and I like this epidemiological study, and I like this road, right? Like, why, why are we continuing to do that? When really, if what we're concerned about is the health of individuals, we should be wanting to make recommendations that promote the health of individuals. So I think, I think that part of what goes on, um, Cope and Allison came up with this idea of white hat bias. I, I, I think it may be one issue that takes place, and, and, and really, the, I, what's behind white hat bias, is the good guy always wears the white hat, right? And so sometimes, I think as scientists, we may disregard some evidence because we think there's righteous means behind it. Like if we really have this idea that natural is better, then we're willing to disregard some of the evidence to say, it's okay for me to disregard it because I have righteous means, and I have righteous ends. And so what I'm willing to do is I'm willing to not look at some of the evidence. And, and, and this, is, this is a terrible thing to take place in science. I think this is very easy for this to take place in kind of health and nutrition as well. Because whenever I talk to someone about health and nutrition, they are so confused about the messages that they received. For example, when I was growing up, we were told, do not eat eggs. Eggs will lead to cardiovascular disease. About five years ago, a study came out that said, if you're not eating eggs, you will develop heart disease. Right? Like, which one is true? Which one is not true? Don't eat fat. Oh, if you want to lose weight, eat a lot of fat. Right? Don't, like, the, the, the messaging is so confusing. And I think what a lot of people have done is just said, so I'm just going to believe what I want to believe. Because we've been given so many conflicting results. And, and so, like, I want us to get back to a place where we say, here's where the science stands. And we can once again trust the science on these issues. 
we can look at the positives and the negatives, the pros and the cons, and we'll have a discussion again about the benefits or the detriments of any of these things in our food system. Um, I don't think anybody's afraid of having that conversation. I think everybody wants to know what promotes health. How do we come together to do the things that we need to do to help people to be healthier? Instead of attacking, we need to be working together with what we're doing. Because we have to stop confusing consumers. When, when people come in and they'll, they'll start to try to do weight loss with, with me, I almost have to start off by saying, okay, so what are the things that you believe that I will not change your mind on? Tell me. Because there's some things that could help you with weight loss, but if you believe it so firmly that you're gonna walk out of here and say, I'm crazy, I don't even wanna go down the road of trying to discuss that. It's amazing the list of things that people will come up to you with. Like, don't talk to me about, don't talk to me about, right? Like, everything that I'm gonna do is natural. Everything that I want to do is, and, and so, okay, well, if, if that's where you stand, then we're going to have to work within those realms because you've been convinced of something that may be less than true. We, we have to stop convincing people of something that's less than true. And, and for people that are reporting on this, I really tell you, please, please make sure that the science base is incredibly solid before we go out and confuse more people with what's going on. We need answers, not more questions, for the most part. The questions we have, we need to be able to go after answers in a scientific way. And when we find it, we need to be able to report that very easily and very significantly. Again, I appreciate your attention through two of my talks now. Um, and I'll be around for questions after the next talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Craig, and I will uh, ask for Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, I'm very happy to be here to um, contribute to this workshop. I'm also delighted to be in Brazil for the first time even though I'm only here for a, a, a few days. This is the title of my uh, talk, um, and here's what I want to uh, cover. So I'm, I'm going to say a little bit about um, appetite control um, and body weight control to set uh, the studies that I'm going to describe in, into context, into that theoretical context. I'm then going to spend quite a lot of time talking about a review that we did, we, we published recently, which looks at a whole variety of evidence on this question of low calorie sweeteners uh, and energy balance and, and appetite. And then I'm going to end on some uh, studies to talk about this issue of, um, uh, of sweetness and whether that may, might increase or possibly decrease appetite. So I probably don't, really need to say this, but with sugar, uh, okay, sorry, can you hear me better now? Good, thank you. So I probably don't need to say this, but with sugar, low calorie sweeteners and control substances like water or non-sweet food or perhaps nothing at all, we can separate out the effects of calories on appetite, so comparing sugar with low calorie sweetness, for example, controlling for sweetness, differing in calories, or we can look at the effects of sweetness. We can compare low calorie sweetness, for example, in a drink, for example, with water. And I'm going to show you um, the results of quite a lot of experiments summarized on, on those uh, topics. Now, if we take uh, two drinks uh, like this, uh, 500 milliliters of Diet Coca-Cola or 500 milliliters of classic Red Coke. Then there's a big difference in, in calories uh, uh, between those uh, two drinks. The question is, what effect might that difference um, uh, have? Well, by removing sugar and calories from 
Um, the meal that I might eat with these, the, uh, one of these drinks. Then we have a, a, a big, quite a big calorie difference. So what's the consequence of that? Well, by reducing the energy content of the meal, I think theoretically it should reduce our overall energy uh, intake. And here are some data that would support that idea. So I think this is a very important study. It's actually been replicated by David Lovitsky and his colleagues and, and other uh, scientists independently of, of David's lab. So in this study, participants on some occasions uh, ate breakfast, and on other occasions, on other days, they missed breakfast. And then their energy intake, their food intake, for the rest of the day was uh, measured. At lunchtime, um, afternoon snacks, uh, and dinner time, and so on. Now, what you can see here is, if participants missed breakfast, then they ate somewhat more food at lunch, more energy at lunch, than if they'd uh, eaten breakfast. But that increase in intake at lunch uh, did not fully compensate, by no means fully compensated for the energy uh, missed at breakfast. And at subsequent meals, there was no further compensation. So over the day, days when they missed breakfast, these participants ate nearly 500 calories less. 